the Tandy Model 100, a beautiful piece of laptop history running at a relaxing 2.5 megahertz. But I think we can do better. I'm going to install an experimental mod that'll hopefully double the speed all the way up to five megahertz. Will it work? Well, stick around and find out because today we're gonna make this device do something that it really wasn't designed to do. Back in 1983, the Tandy Model 100 was a top-of-the-line portable computer. Running at around 2.5 MHz, this machine was used in a variety of ways, from writing articles and reports, to using custom ROMs for specialized functionality, or even playing games. This durable device has certainly lasted over the years. You'll see many of them available in the wild, and most of them still work. But if you use one today, one thing you'll definitely notice is the speed. Even when you're just working on documents, it becomes quite sluggish when doing things like inserting and moving around text. Thankfully though, Steve Adolph from the Model 100 forums has devised a mod that'll potentially double the speed of the Tandy Model T laptops to five megahertz. I say potentially because there are a couple of caveats and it may not work with every device at least not without a couple of modifications. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Steve created a custom circuit board that piggybacks on top of the CPU inside the Model 100. Now I'm gonna walk you through how to do this mod, but if you wanna do it yourself, then you can order a set of the boards from today's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay offers quality circuit boards as well as other services like PCB assembly, 3D printing, sheet metal work, injection molding, and CNC machining. It's really a one-stop shop for electronics design and manufacturing. And as you know, PCBWay are huge supporters of the maker and retro computing communities. They don't just sponsor videos like mine, but they also support hundreds of student and hobbyist projects around the world. And better yet, when you buy the boards for this Model 100 project from PCBWay, it's only going to set you back five bucks. Thank you PCBWay for supporting this channel by sponsoring today's video. All right, let's dig in and take a look at how this mod works. One of the key things that governs the speed of a computer is how fast the processor is running, and that's determined by its clock signal. A clock signal oscillates between a higher and lower voltage, and when the change occurs from a low to high or a high to low signal, it triggers an operation in the CPU. The faster the clock oscillates, the faster the CPU runs, and conversely, a slower clock will run the CPU slower. Now the Model 100 has a 4.9152 MHz crystal that drives the clock on its ADC85 CPU. This clock signal enters the CPU on pins 1 and 2. The ADC85 has an internal clock generator that divides this signal in half and this sets the processor's internal operating frequency. The halved signal is then output on pin 37 to provide the system clock for other components on the mainboard. Now in theory, we should be able to increase the input clock to 9.8304 megahertz, and that should increase the CPU and system clock to 4.9152 megahertz. But things are rarely that simple. There's some downstream impacts that we need to resolve if we want to make this work. Here's a high level block diagram of the Model 100's architecture. You'll notice that everything in the system connects to the CPU in some way. Some components like the barcode reader interface talk to the CPU directly. In this case, the data flows to and from dedicated pins on the chip. But other components are on the system bus. Now, the system bus is kind of like a highway in that it helps to transport data from one place to another. If, for example, the CPU wants to read data from RAM, it would put the address that it wants to read from on the address portion of the system bus. And this signals to the RAM chip 
to put the data on the data portion of the system bus. This whole set of interactions is controlled with specific timing intervals, and each chip has an upper limit of how fast it can run. If the CPU goes too fast, the other components may not be able to respond quickly enough before the CPU moves on to the next operation. But how fast is too fast? Well, that depends on the chip. This, for example, is the ROM chip from my Tandy Model 100. According to the service manual, the ROM chip has an access time of up to 600 nanoseconds. So when this chip is used, it could take up to 600 nanoseconds for it to provide its data. So as long as the CPU waits 600 nanoseconds before moving on to the next operation, then there shouldn't be any problems. But remember that the Model 100 runs at 2.4576 MHz. If you do the math, you'll see that the clock ticks around every 400 nanoseconds. However, the ADC85 CPU adds one extra clock tick before latching in the data from the bus. So the ROM chip has really two clock cycles to respond with the data. But in reality, this works out to more like 680 nanoseconds because the address latch signal has to be turned off first and it takes up about 130 nanoseconds in that first clock tick. Now imagine what would happen if we were to double the speed of the CPU to 4.9152 megahertz. The time for each tick of the clock would reduce down to 200 nanoseconds. So our ROM chip now only has 270 nanoseconds to respond with its data. So in order for this mod to work, we need to replace the ROM chip with a faster one. And for that, I'm going to use this EEPROM, which has a 45 nanosecond access time, way faster than the stock 600 nanosecond ROM. But the pinout for the Model 100's ROM is different than the one for this chip, so we need to use an adapter board. But first, I'll need to burn the Model 100 ROM image onto the EEPROM chip. And for this, I'll use my trusty TL866 programmer and a copy of the Model 100 ROM image from the M100 wiki. After a couple of minutes, I have a fresh 45 nanosecond ROM chip ready to use. Let's test it out before moving on. All right, everything looks great. So let's go ahead and assemble our mod board. You'll notice that this board is about the size of the CPU chip. And that's because it'll actually sit on top of the CPU when it's installed. We'll start with the seven surface mount chips. Here we have an inverter, a decoder, a binary counter, and a flip-flop. And there's also a multiplexer, another flip-flop, and a NAND gate. Now, as usual, we'll put solder on just one of the pads. And then line up the chip by soldering just one leg. And solder down the other legs. Each chip needs to be put on in a specific orientation. So we need to pay attention to the markings on the board and make sure that the notch on the chip aligns with the notch in the silk screen. Next, we'll add our capacitors. We have four caps. Two of them are 22 picofarad, and the other two 
are 0.47 microfarad. Now to make sure that the board sits correctly on top of the CPU, we need to solder the through-hole components a little differently than we normally would. Instead of putting them all the way through the holes, we'll instead cut the legs really short. And I'm actually going to set these clipped legs aside because I'm going to use them later when I install the board. And then we want to solder the part on the top side of the board. Now this will make sure that there's not a solder bump on the underside of the PCB that prevents the board from sitting flat against the CPU. The components labeled C1 and C2 both get the 22 picofarad caps. And C5 gets one of the 0.47 microfarad caps. Now C3 and C4 determine what the startup speed of the system is. If you want it to start up at normal speed, then solder the other 0.47 microfarad cap into C3. But if you want it to start at 5 MHz, solder it to C4. Now I'm going to set mine to normal speed just in case there's an issue with this mod. Next we'll move on to the resistors. Here we have one 510 ohm resistor, a single one mega ohm resistor, and two 10 kilo ohm resistors. We use the same technique that we used with the capacitors. R3 and R4 both get a 10 kilo ohm resistor. R1 is the 499 ohm resistor. And R2 is the 1 mega ohm resistor. The last part is our new crystal oscillator. Now this one has a frequency of 9.8304 megahertz, and that's double the speed of the original one. Now even though this is a through hole part, we can't solder it to the top side of the board because the can's in the way. So I'll first insert the part, and then turn it over and trim the legs flush before putting on solder. And I'm just going to use a little bit of solder and try not to build up too much of a solder bump under the board. All right, the board's all done, so let's get it installed. Okay, here's my daily driver model 100. We'll start off by unscrewing the four screws that hold the case together. And we'll open it up and disconnect the top half. Okay, here's the 8085 CPU. Like I mentioned earlier, this mod board will piggyback on top of it. To connect it to the CPU's pins, I'm going to use the leftover leads that I clipped from when I assembled the board. We'll need to solder these leads onto 12 of the CPU's pins. Now the way I'm going to do this is to first tin the pin with a little bit of solder. And then just tack on the clipped leg. Now the pins we need to tap into are Number 1, which is one of the input pins for the clock. Pin 12, now that's the least significant bit for the address line. Pin 20, which is ground. Pin 40 supplies 5 volts to the board. Pin 34 is the IOM pin, which indicates whether there's an IO operation or a memory operation being performed by the CPU. Pins 32, 31, and 30 access the read, write, and ALE pins, and pins 28, 27, 26, and 25 are the upper four bits for the address line. Okay, now our mod board should just slip right on. And we'll use a little solder to connect each pin. Okay, now we'll need to connect two wires, but before we do, I want to explain what they're for. You'll notice that I have all four RAM chips populated in my Model 100 for a total of 32 kilobytes of RAM. The chip here labeled M9 is the default 8 kilobyte chip that the system came with. And the other three RAM modules are all socketed and added in afterwards. Not only are these chips different, but they also run at different speeds. Notice that the 8 kilobyte chip that's soldered in ends in a dash 4. Looking in the datasheet, 
you'll see that the dash four means that this RAM module has a 200 nanosecond access time. And these other chips end in dash 15. That data sheet indicates that these are 150 nanosecond chips. So the expansion RAM is actually faster than the factory installed RAM. If you take into account what I said earlier, this shouldn't be a problem. Because remember, these RAM chips have 270 nanoseconds to respond to the CPU's requests. But you have to remember that the Tandy Model 100 was designed to be a portable computer. So it goes out of its way to minimize power consumption to conserve the battery. And one way it does this is by keeping the RAM decoders turned off unless there's a memory operation taking place. To understand what's going on, let's take a look at the memory selection logic in the schematic. Here you'll see that we have our four SRAM chips, which are labeled M6, M7, M8, and M9. The two chips labeled M3 and M4 are decoder chips. You can set the three address pins on these chips, and depending on which pins you activate, one of the output lines will be brought low. And these output pins are connected to the chip select pins on each of the memory chips. But also notice that there's a signal called A star, which feeds into pin six of both decoder chips. This serves as an enablement signal. If A star is low, then the chip is turned off and all the outputs are driven high, which means that none of the memory chips are selected. Well, why does this matter? Well, the problem that we'll run into here is the timing of when A star is actually activated. Chip M17 looks like a NOR gate in the schematic, but it's actually a NAND gate. So when either of the inputs are brought low, A star is taken high. Now notice what feeds the input of this NAND gate. Those are the memory read and memory write lines coming out of the CPU. When there's either a read or a write operation happening to memory, A star is activated, and that in turn activates the RAM decoder chips. But it turns out that when we run the CPU at 5 MHz, the A star activation process is too slow. We need to give the RAM chip more time after A star turns on in order for the memory operation to succeed. To do this, Steve came up with a clever little trick. Here's the timing diagram for a memory operation on the ADC85 CPU. Notice that the read and write signals are activated 50 nanoseconds after data is permitted on the bus. If that's when A star goes active, then the response window for the memory is only 230 nanoseconds. But also notice that the ALE line always gets set in the first clock tick. So what Steve did was he built some discrete logic onto the mod board that enables the A star signal on the falling edge of ALE in the first tick. And then when both read and write lines are brought high, in other words, when no memory operations occurring, the A star signal gets turned off. By doing this, A star is activated early enough to give the RAM time to respond to the CPU's request. And to make this work, we'll inject this new A star signal here. So we'll need to snip pin 14 of the chip labeled M20. And then we'll use a wire to connect that pin with the A star pad on the mod board. Okay, there's one more thing we need to do before we can close it up. This chip right here is our UART, or Universal Asynchronous Receiver and Transmitter. Its job is to control the data exchange with the RS-232C serial port and the built-in modem. And in order to do that correctly, it needs to run at specific timings. Now going back to the schematic, you'll notice that the UART chip gets a clock signal from the 81C55, which is our I.O. controller. And the 81C55 gets its clock signal from pin 37 of the CPU. And here's where the problem is. Overclocking the CPU will have a downstream effect of overclocking the UART, and that'll break the serial data exchange timings in the RS-232C port and the modem. So to work around this, 
we need to inject the system's original clock speed into the 81C55 chip at pin 3. Now there's a pad on the mod board labeled 2.45M, so you'll need to first solder one end of a wire there. And then I'm going to snip pin 3 of the PIO chip and solder the other end of the wire directly to it. All right, and that's our clock doubler mod fully installed. <laughs> Isn't she a beaut? Well, let's close it up and try it out. Now for the moment of truth. Did I break my Model 100? Okay, well, everything seems to work. But remember that I have this set to boot up in its normal speed. So there should really be no difference right now. To put it into 5 MHz mode, we need to run the command out85, 1. Okay, so it should now be running in 5 MHz mode. Let's see if that maze generator runs faster. Oh yeah, that is quite a bit faster. Well, here it is in comparison to its normal clock speed. All right, well, let's try running a game. First, I'm going to set it back to normal speed. And I'm going to load up Starblaze 100. Now, this was a game made by Radio Shack back in 1983. It's interesting. This machine was primarily a business machine, but there were some games released for the Model 100. And this is one of the better ones, in my opinion. And it seems to play like it normally does here. All right, now let's put the Model 100 into turbo mode. And we'll restart the game. And yeah, it doesn't work. Well, this is a known issue. No one really knows why Starblaze 100 doesn't work with the 5 MHz mod. But here's one thing that's interesting. Listen to the sound when I fire a bullet. Here it is compared to Starblaze running in its normal speed. It's a little bit difficult to pick up on, but the bullet sound in 5 MHz mode is actually shorter than when it's running in normal speed. And that just shows that the machine is indeed running faster. Well, this is a really interesting mod. I think I'm going to leave it installed for a while and see how it holds up. All the credit for this mod goes to Steve Adolph. Thank you, Steve, for putting this mod together and making it available for the community and for helping me understand how it all works as I was putting this video together. If you want to do this mod yourself, there's a link to the Gerber files and the parts list in the description below. You can head over to PCBWay and grab a set of these boards for only $5. All right, that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hey, but until then, go make something cool.